Hi, welcome to module one. So most of our course is going to be grounded in some really practical things that we can do um, to help English language learners in um, our interactions, in, in our instruction, in uh, support. But in order to get there, uh, today I want to spend some time thinking about one of the underpinnings of modern linguistics or, or linguistic uh, applied linguistics. And that's the notion of world Englishes. And so we're going to dive, uh, do a bit of a deep dive into why an understanding of world English or world English is, which, which I'll get to in a second, why that is the right, um, the right tense for it, is important to supporting English language learners. When we think of English, it's easy to think of it as this monolithic thing, that it's this um, single formation, the single linguistic formation. And we all know that there are variations in English and the way that we use English that are regional, right? So in the, uh, in the Northeast, we say things like soda instead of pop, or we say things, you know, people say you guys, even though it's not uh, gender, great uh, as a gender um, collective, uh, but, but that's, you know, something that is typical to uh, Northeastern, Central New Yorkian um, utterances. And we have all kinds of really kind of micro regional habits. If you look like, you know, down south, people are, have a tendency to say y'all instead. Uh, and that's part of their linguistic tradition. That's part of their discourse community. Um, and, and you could think of a million things that are like this, that are, are very specific to the region. And, and I can point you to some, some interesting uh, work that's been done on, on trying to contextualize American English in the ways that we speak in a different region of the country. But that's not really, um, those aren't really different dialects of the language, and they're not really different variations of the language. It's just different uh, patterns of discourse, word choices. The way world, the way, a better way to understand world English is is understanding that uh, the way that we speak English, the way that somebody produces the English language varies based on where they learned it, what their first language was, what, how many additional languages that they know. And that this notion of this central academic English is problematic, especially problematic in instructional spaces like the one we work in. But it's also in, uh, problematic culturally. We're, we're going to try to peel back some of uh, the rationale for that today. So I'm going to share my screen. And so I want to say before I start that this presentation is an adaptation from uh, Dr. Rebecca Oxford from the University of Maryland. Um, this was this is an adaptation of a presentation that she gave to the National Museum of Language um, back in 2014. And so it, I think it's important and I think she did a really nice job of, of framing some of these things quickly. Because they're they're really complex concepts that have uh, really deep cultural roots. And so um, I'm appreciative for that work. So first out. Um, what is or are world Englishes, right? And so this notion of a world English or, or multiple world Englishes, which is, which is technically more correct, even though Microsoft Word puts a squiggly under it every time I write it. Um, but it's generally considered this umbrella term that encompasses a whole bunch of different ways of speaking English. And so this uh, covers regional dialectical differences this covers syntax differences, which we'll get to, uh, but it's an understanding of the ways that the practice of speaking English shifts based on the practitioner, based on the person who is speaking. And it really begins to ask the question, who owns English? And this is the work that happens in, in um, a major way in the reading in our first module. What it discusses, what our first module uh, discusses, Jennifer Jenkins talks about um, English is a 
a, a quote unquote lingua franca. And a lingua franca is a, a language of negotiation. And it recognizes this idea that English has moved from just being a, a first language that you learn and that lives in, in um, primarily English speaking countries, but it becomes this transactional language so that if you have a person from France talking to a person from China, um, that they probably each don't know French or, or you know, Mandarin Chinese or, or what have you, but they probably both know English or at least some English. And in a space where you have people who uh, are both speaking English as an additional language, conversing in that additional language, the parameters change and the goals change and the way the language is used uh, also changes. And finally, ownership changes. If we're gonna say that we have a single correct version of English, we have to be able to point to somebody and say that their version is correct. And so I'm not sure, even if we were to restrict this to, to uh, primarily English speaking countries, if we would ever be able to agree on a common correct way of, of speaking English. A good way to think about, uh, or a good context for understanding uh, world Englishes is Cockrew's uh, circles. And so these circles, the inner circle, outer circle, and expanding circle show the way that English uh, and, and the use of English has shifted. And so easy way to understand it, inner circle um, are primarily English first countries that were uh, settled by the UK, largely settled occupied, settled by the UK, by UK um, settlers who came to live there as colonists, right? Um, the second circle, the outer circle, um, were colonies of, of the UK. And so I think occupied, long occupied territories, Australia, uh, Hong Kong, India, Singapore, Right, and so these were uh, were not resettled uh, people from Great Britain. These were, in fact, um, these were, in fact, occupied territories. And so, in those spaces, the people in those territories needed to learn English as a second language in order to transact, in order to um, do business with, in order to live in their occupied territory. And the expanding circle or the third circle are spaces that were never occupied territories right? or were never occupied by English speaking people, but it emerged as a foreign language because of a need to do business with or, or is it in a, from a need to um, communicate more effectively with inner circle countries, inner circle, excuse me, inner circle speakers. And so you can see that that there's, in addition to a linguistic piece, there's a political and a historical piece at play um, that that's in, that's significant. It also means that in outer circle countries, that in order to access power, in order to access resources, there was a need to quickly develop a second fluency, right, a second language. And uh, in expanding circles, th th this changes. So what we notice is conversation between the circles, right? That the further out you get, what you recognize is that you have more practitioners. If you look at these numbers, now these are numbers as of, and so I'm sure they've shifted. These are numbers as of like 2001. These aren't great numbers, um, but you can see that you know, the, our inner circle US, UK, uh, much of Canada, right? Our inner circle countries make up three, uh, 320 to 380 million. Whereas our outer circle and expanding circle, right? Are more than twice that. And so triple that, quadruple that. Um, so the question is who owns English in, in this scenario? 
And what value is there in restricting our understanding of English to a specific set of English rules? There's another way of looking at it. Um, you know, we have these older Englishes, we have American English and Canadian English and British English and Scottish English and Irish English, right? So we have these older ideas of English. And then we have versions of English that emerged as a result. And so these are pigeons and creoles. And so easiest recognition of this is uh, black vernacular English or uh, Creole or Hawaiian English. Um, all of these, uh, Spanglish is another, um, all of these are pigeons are amalgamations of English and another language or English and another set of languages or combinations of language. Now the irony of this is English itself emerged as a pidgin language between French and German, right? So you had uh, in 1066, William the Conqueror came and occupied Southern England and, uh, and overthrew the lords and the nobility uh, in those little fiefdoms and uh, forced the people to the best they could to speak French. And so you had these mostly German-ish speaking, right? So it was um, Anglican, Anglo speaking um, English inhabitants. And when the French came, you know, so our most of English is French and German. And there's all kinds of really interesting um, linguistical characteristics of our language that, that um, I won't get into, but I certainly, uh, certainly would like to and could. Uh, and if you're interested in having a conversation, um, you know where my office is. But ultimately, um, when we look at it in this way, that even in the inner circle, we have so many different um, iterations of the language. And what we primarily point to when we talk about English, when we talk about English usage, is this, uh, is this notion of academic English that is published in textbooks. And what this does is it privileges people who speak a uh, speak from a, in a discourse community that closely mirrors academic English. But what's even more important, now I want to recontextualize this because I don't want to get too far outside of our norms, but what's even more important um, in this regard is the fact that when you're learning English, that if you want to learn English effectively and if you want to adopt the, the ideas of English quickly, then you need to have a communicative objective, right? So the people need to understand what you're saying. And so for instance, some languages uh, come from, um, a different syntax tradition, right? So when we speak English, we say, I go to the store, right? So we have uh, subject, verb, object. In many languages, um, you're shifting and you have an object subject verb to the store I go. Um, and so when somebody's learning English, it's not just that they're learning the vocabulary of English. So they're not just learning the, the verbs and they're not just learning tenses. They're also trying to rewire and shift their syntax. They're trying to do multiple things at once. And the more we stack, in that context, the more we stack on them in terms of responsibility, what we see as being proficient, the more challenging it is for them to reach a degree of proficiency because we're further complicating um, the equation. And Sarish Kanaga, kind of, excuse me, Sarish Kanagaraja um, believes he's a, uh, a linguist out of, I think he's at the uh, University of Massachusetts. Um, so he's at University of Massachusetts now. Um, believes that we're moving beyond the three circles. Essentially, he says that the circles are leaking, that we don't have this, uh, this very neat kind of um, series of levels of English, that what we really have is we have uh, this amalgamation, we have blurry edges in those circles. And you know the ways that technology connects people, for instance, in call centers, we all speak with outer circle speakers, expanding circle speakers, every time we pick up our phone and recognize that we're calling a call center. 
And so we have inner circle individuals reliant on outer circle varieties of, of English. And we're transacting with those outer circle. We also have people who are living in India and living in China who are teaching English who have never visited or spoken with a first circle speaker. We have people from, uh, from South Korea, for instance, uh, many linguists from South Korea teaching English to people in, uh, in, in other spaces, in other linguistic spaces. So ultimately, there is nothing in the center anymore. That the notion of a center really is something that's constructed by textbooks. It's constructed by the academic kind of um, monolith, right? The academic uh, um, elite. Uh, people who um, are really are interested in preserving this notion of English that in many ways doesn't exist in many places. People construct English as it suits their purpose in a given context and at a given time. And your ability to use English effectively stems from your ability to clearly communicate your idea to another practitioner, to another, to another English speaker. And really when we're talking about supporting English language learners, when we're talking about English in a college setting, what I think we all need to think about, and when I say we all, I don't mean just you know, in, our, in our academic support role, but what we all need to think about, I think is, is what are we requiring of students and what do we consider proficient and how are we supporting students? Now, for many of us, this is this is the norm. When we talk to students who speak in accented English or who uh, are, aren't quite at the proficiency level where they need to be, we recognize their world English. We recognize what they're coming to the table with and we help them to build proficiency. But what I think is important is to get as many people as possible thinking about the ramifications of judgments of proficiency. Can we understand the topic? Can we understand the ideas? Uh, are the students advancing in their, in their ability to communicate complex um, perspectives and opinions in our sessions or in the classroom? Um, and we already kind of talked a bit about this, but there's also, you know, it, this is something that even though maybe we think in, in our local community, that this has already been an, an objective that's been achieved. There are many spaces where um, people prefer native English speaking teachers um, to non-native English uh, speaking teachers uh, for language instruction. Even though non-native English speaking teachers, uh, NNESTS or NNESTs, um, have the background of having learned the language can provide, in many cases, a clearer path to how to acquire the language um, because, they've, because they've gone there. And yet, um, there's, still that, there's still a bit of that favoritism. And what, I'm gonna think, what I wanna think about as we're reading, to bring this back to uh, the Jennifer Jenkins text, is when we begin thinking about English as a lingua franca, when we begin thinking about English as a transactional language, how does that shift the way we teach English? How does that shift the way we support students? How does that shift some of our ideas about uh, linguistic norms? I know it's forced me as a writing teacher, um, as a writing professor, to re-examine some of the things that I require of students in early drafts. And certainly, you know, I, 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 because I can't uh, end our presentation without talking about AI, certainly I know that AI is shifting uh, the way that we think about proficiency. And specifically, um, the most important thing at this point is being able to communicate a unique idea clearly and synthesize multiple perspectives and bring your own lived experiences to the table. If we can do that in a variety of English and we can, uh, we can use assistive um, or generative technology to shift the English that we're using, I think that that's in, there's many arguments, I'm not gonna go and say that that's correct, but I think there are many arguments for um, using the technology in that way because it makes us clearer. It preserves our own perspectives and it preserves our own opinions and it allows us to clearly articulate our, our ideas to a different audience. 
And at the end of the day, I think that's what rhetoric, um, that's, that's the goal of, of strong rhetoric. So um, I look forward to hearing your thoughts and perspectives in uh, the discussion board. If you have any questions or if you'd like to talk about this further, um, please feel free to stop by. Um, my door is, is typically open. And uh, I appreciate, once again, I appreciate your participation uh, in this professional program.